The annual Charles Yancey Book Fair will take place this Saturday in Roxbury. To tell us about the event is our guest, the co-founder and district city councillor from Mattapan in Dorchester, Charles Yancey. Uh, thank you very much for being with us again, Councillor. Well, Chris, let me thank you and Neighborhood Network News for providing this opportunity to spread the word about our 29th annual book fair. It was back in February 28th, 1987, where my sister Linda and my wife Marzetta and my staff at, at that time decided to give back to the community and create an event that we never really anticipated would become an annual event. Here we are, 29 years later. Well, I, I remember that event <laughs> you know, off in a side room in the Cobbin Square Branch Library. That's this is right. going to be a bigger setting, so talk us about what you've got lined yes, up. Yes, we have outgrown the uh, Cobbin Square Community Room uh, almost from the beginning. Uh, we still use that room to process uh, today 40,000 uh, new books. But we have migrated out of uh, Dorchester into Roxbury at the Reggie Lewis uh, track and field facility that can accommodate more than 2,000 individuals. And uh, we do expect between one and 2,000 folks to, to arrive. Uh, we're going to offer face painting, a lot of entertainment for the young people, as well as storytelling. Uh, there'll be some gospel singing for the older set. And most of all, uh, in the highlight of the of the day and perhaps of the year is the actual distribution of uh, of those books which have been separated to make sure that they're age appropriate uh, with brand new book bags and a great deal of excitement. And I have to confess uh, that when the one or two thousand folks show up, they don't show up to hear a speech from Councilor Yancey. They show up because they believe in education and they know how important it is. Uh, for families to have books in their home and to encourage particularly our young people to develop a love for reading. And the theme of this year's um, uh, book fair is reading is a joy. So we want to make sure that everyone has fun at the book fair and well beyond that point. By the way, uh, talk about the ages because uh, you know, we're talking about some very uh, early ages here. Yes, too. we have uh, books for pre-K, uh, books for uh, young people in the first to third grade, actually all the way up to high school, but we also uh, provide books for people who are postdoctorate students and just the general public. Uh, and we have books for virtually every taste uh, in the city of Boston, but our focus uh, primarily is to encourage our young people to begin to accept responsibility for their own education. So, so while we have books for right. adults, uh, our focus is on young people. Well, the other thing, uh, I want to get back to the fun part. Yes. W what do you remember about this uh, it being fun? Well, I, I remember when uh, we had Bonaparte, the ma a magician, uh, who put a, a dunce hat on Tom Menino. And, <laughs> and uh, well, we had uh, skits from Ronald McDonald and, and many, many other uh, you know, fun times. But we also had storytelling by Irene Smalls. Uh, we try to provide a very mixed uh, format. Uh, we, we had uh, folks who sing in operas and mm -hmm. other uh, local entertainers who, who want to encourage our young people to develop a habit of reading and accept responsibility for their own education. Of course, you, you've also uh, had this maybe as a parent or as a kid. What, what is it about it? I mean, well, you open the book and you, somebody starts reading it. Yes, I think it's a great bonding experience. Uh, to have a parent read to his or her child, and as the children progress, to have the children read to the parents. I think it's mutually reinforcing, very positive, um, and it is still in style today, in spite of the digital age that we happen to be in. Reading still is uh, fundamental, and we are providing that opportunity to so many families which may not have a wealth of uh, books and reading material in the home. And, and talk about the importance of that, just having a book that's yours. You know, the sense of ownership of a book is almost like, like a sense of ownership of, of one's education. And I believe that uh, the ability just to uh, grab a book, sometimes at random, I mean, many families have thousands of books at home and many other families don't have any at all. Uh, but we're providing the opportunity so our young people will get in the habit of uh, reading and understanding uh, the very complexities of this world or just to have a fun time. So we should mention the exact time and place it? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Chris. It's going to be this Saturday, July 25th, 
12 noon to 3 at the Reggie Lewis Center, which is at 1350 Tremont Street uh, as a part of the Roxbury Community College Complex. Right near Roxbury Crossing Station. That's right. We should also mention you have a hearing coming up in August on the use of body cameras by police yes. officers. Tell yes. us a little bit what you're lining well, up here. Everyone is aware of uh, many confrontations that take place between citizens and the police. Uh, there's a great deal of controversy raging throughout the United States of America today concerning the feasibility or efficacy of uh, having those police officers wear body cams since they're so cameras are so pervasive in today's society and we have the technology to actually attach cameras to, uh, to individuals. Why not document some of these interactions between the public and the police so that if questions arise about the appropriateness of certain behavior on the part of individual officers, you have a video record of it. And I believe that uh, even Commissioner Evans relied a great deal on video of uh, two incidents of deadly force right here in the city of Boston. But the video uh, did not come from the police department. They came from cameras attached to poles and businesses in various commercial districts. And if it was used to exonerate the police in those cases, then why not require all police to at least have those cameras available with a certain set of instructions as to when it's appropriate to turn the cameras on or off. Uh, and that's provided for in our, in our proposed legislation. But I believe that um, it's inevitable that our officers will be uh, uh, equipped with these cameras and that they will be used pervasively throughout the United States of America. And in spite of some privacy concerns that I have, I think it's going to be a positive contribution to reducing the amount of uh, negative interaction between the police and citizens and residents. I, I know uh, the police have said, well, this could also affect the, uh, the rights of people that they're encountering. Uh, maybe they have some rights of privacy that might be yes. violated. Uh, do you worry about that? Yes, and that's why what we prescribed a very detailed and somewhat complex set of rules and regulations offered by the American Civil Liberties Union, for example, and others to safeguard against violation of privacy. But the reality, Chris, as you know, you cannot travel anywhere in the city of Boston or perhaps anywhere in the country where you're not under surveillance. It's an unhappy situation as far as I'm concerned, but it's reality. Uh, so why not use it to the benefit of the police and the residents so that when those confrontations take place and there's some dispute as to whether an individual officer abused his or her authority or not, at least this video evidence will go a long way to clearing the air and establishing what actually happened. But let me hasten to add that this is not an anti-police measure at all. I have the utmost respect for our police officers. They risk their lives every day to protect the public and they deserve to be supported. Uh, one other item on the agenda, uh, the, the Boston Olympics uh, yes. just yesterday in, in uh, the city council meeting, uh, Tito Jackson filed a measure to have some undisclosed pages released to the public from the original bid yes. document. Uh, it never came to a vote. There was some procedural razzle-dazzle there, but it was clear that most people in the council wanted this release, including you. Well, yes, I think it's very important that we create an atmosphere of transparency and openness uh, so that the cynicism surrounding the uh, proposal to, to host an Olympics in the city of Boston can begin to wane. Uh, I have not stated a position pro or against the Olympics, although quite frankly, I like the idea. Uh, but the devil is in the details. We do not want to create a situation where uh, the Olympics become a burden on the taxpayers of Boston. We don't want to create a situation where the conditions of people living in the city of Boston becomes worse rather than better because of the Olympics. We do not want to encourage displacement of people or gentrification. So there's a lot of details that have to be worked out. But I supported uh, the proposal by Councillor Jackson to subpoena this information so that we can know whether or not there was any commitment made that's going to result in draining of resources from the city of Boston. And the point I made on the council floor yesterday uh, was that we should focus, spend at least 10% of the time 
that we spend discussing the Olympics on building some decent school facilities, particularly the high school, as you know, that I've been advocating for for the better part of the last decade and a half. Uh, it's a serious matter because we haven't built a high school since 1979, and our children have to compete with other children who are going to state-of-the-art facilities, and our children deserve it as much as anyone else. So I will continue to, uh, to push that issue. We did make progress. Uh, we did get a uh, two-thirds vote of the city council a few months ago on the issue. We have to get a second reading. But most of all, we have to tell Marty Walsh that we have waited far too long already. Let's go ahead and build a high school that he'll be proud of and that the uh, future students of Boston uh, will be proud of as well. And that has to be done long before we host any Olympics in the city of Boston. Thank you very much for being with us. Well, thank you, Chris. City Councilor Charles Yancey. We'll have more news in just a moment.